Find out how Prince Harry is controlling the narrative by carefully stage managing his public appearances. And speaking of stage managing, Rupert Bell is here and he's going to talk to me all about how they stage manage that last moment at Polo that everybody's talking about with Meghan Markle. That's all coming up right here on Airs and Spares. Hello and welcome to Airs and Spares, the show where we bring you insight and opinion into the lives of two very famous royal couples on both sides of the Atlantic. I'm Kinsey Schofield and I'll be bringing you updates on the Duke and Duchess of Sussex here in California. And over here in Britain, I'll be bringing you updates on the Prince and Princess of Wales as they continue their Easter break. It's so good to have you back with us this week, Rupert. Um, and. I I really can't wait to get some of your insight on polo etiquette. Uh, we'll talk about that in the Meghan and Harry section. Uh, Katie is off this week, but let's start with these new poll results. This is um, a YouGov poll for popularity, likability, and I know for a fact because I love watching your commentary, that it is going to be no surprise to you that Catherine, the Princess of Wales, is the most popular royal. Why is it that we just, and I, why, why do we just love this woman so much? She is just, she's beautiful, she's stunning, she's sweet. Well, I think those are three reasons probably why, and she just gets on with the job. And also, in given the circumstances, there's also going to be a, a sympathetic vote for her as well in a poll like this because everyone's going to be wishing her well. And they saw her in that video that she put out uh, revealing that she's undergoing cancer treatment. Now, that's always going to uh, create a, a sympathetic viewpoint. And it does prove just how much also that uh, the uh, sort of the William Harry generation of royals miss her out on the public stage because there is an element, and I can tell you, when I go back to my other, we always end up seem to be talking about racing and horse sports, but I'll tell you, and I'll give you an example, Royal Ascot, when she turns up, if, for instance, William turns up, well, the papa, well, the photographers there will be hugely disappointed because she is the big star in town as far as her. what she's wearing, what she's looking at. Here she is with William. It is, they are a team. And yet she brings the, the showbiz pizzazz. And you've seen it at premieres that she's gone to when she's with Tom Cruise or people like that. She does attract a, an extra frisson of excitement around her because, A, she looks good and, and always is, represents the royal family in such a positive light. But obviously now to see her at the top, I think you have to put that down to the fact that uh, there is the sympathy, but also she is, and the royal family know it, the big star attraction, with all due respect to the King, the Queen, and Prince William. How much of um, our love for Catherine do you think also comes from the fact that we feel like we grew up with her too? We ha we've seen her since she was a young woman and we've watched her become this graceful mother. Well, I think we have to look at it and say that she's been around now for a long time. From the moment she was at university, well, that's 20 odd years. So she's had plenty of time to get into the public consciousness and obviously the on-off element there was a to their relationship as it went through various sort of dips and sort of was she going to be prepared to marry William all those kind of things following her days at uh, their days at St Andrews University in Scotland so in the end I think we've just got come to know what she's um, about and realize that she is a rock solid member of the royal family, it's not easy for her. And I, I, without question, I think the the microscope that is inevitably on her puts a lot of pressure on somebody. And actually that's, that's part of the problem for any prospective bride coming into the royal family. You know, you don't, you're not just like any old bride, you are going to be photographed, analyzed, your every mood, mood's kind of be, just look what's going on in Denmark at the moment yes. with their royal family, the scrutiny that they're under about is the relationship on and off who's been you know that's the level and of course that's the kind of you've got to have a mental fortitude to put up with it because it was it's been relentless for 20 years everywhere she goes she gets photographed and it's very hard for her to sort of go back to being a, a private lady again okay she knew what she was taking on and has to accept that but at the same time the level of scrutiny I think would would test anybody as we have seen. 
All right, I'm going to ask you something a little controversial and then we'll move on. You know, it was always rumored that Prince Charles was envious of Princess Diana's popularity and Prince William is at number two underneath the Princess of Wales. I don't see that there, there's never felt like there's been any envy there between Prince William and the Princess of Wales. Uh, do, do you agree with me? Uh, I think I have to agree with you on that. And I think it's a different era. Let's be honest. That, you know, the King and Princess Diana, there's a lot of dynamics going on there. You know, there was the age gap and she did sort of elevate the sort of level of excitement around her with, a, you know, she was a, a showbiz princess and, and really knew how to capitalize on the PR, which blindsided the more traditional views of the royal family. That was why we had all the, the fallout when she died, because she had the PR support right behind her. And that must have frustrated Prince Charles at the time while he was just getting on with his job. But obviously he was seen as the villain of the piece. So that's not a surprise that she he, he was not as popular. But in Prince William's case, I think he will take a fairly pragmatic view to it and just say it goes with the territory. He's, they've got three children to worry about. Uh, and let's, you know, polls. Yeah, you read into what you like. I'm sure he's not pouring too long over the significance of the poll. Also, yeah, that, that number one, that's also my wife. They, I get to go home with her. Yeah. I'm sure that that's a little yeah. bit of a perk, too. Uh, so the latest reports, and you and I discussed this pretty extensively and agreed upon this, and here, here are the, these reports weeks later. Prince William and Princess Catherine are very unlikely to meet Harry and potentially Meghan when they come to the UK for the Invictus Games, the 10th anniversary. Um, I think that you would probably say, told you so. <laughs> What's your reaction? Again, I, I can't, I, no surprise, because they clearly are now, it is important the Invictus Games gets um, its its moment in the sunshine. But the problem is, Harry now is sort of worried about the security arrangements for it and probably can use it as a simple excuse and say, I'm not happy to bring Meghan here because I'm not happy with the security arrangements. Well, my answer to that is, I'm afraid he will have all the necessary security because something like that, will have a high profile element to it and this summer because of the significance of it. So there will be security around it. So I don't, we know it's probably all part of the sort of ongoing court case and it's an easy stick to bear and it's a convenient excuse for Megan to say, I'm not gonna come here because she knows, and we go back to that poll, that she's right near the bottom of that poll, um, almost a little more popular in that poll than Prince Andrew, but by not by much, it has to be said, in this country. So I think it's an easy thing to say, and that's one of the excuses he might make. And if Harry can find time to go and see them, he will be on his own, because I think that's where they, these meetings, if they're going to be a rapprochement, it has to be just probably first up with Harry and the family sitting around, and then worry about what we do with with Megan and how we incorporate her back if there is ever to be a rapprochement. But I I feel that's a long way to go, and I think uh, William and uh, Catherine have their own issues to resolve, which which is primarily get her better, and they don't need the stresses and the strains. And the king at the same time, he wants to get better, and this all adds to the sort of strain that maybe the family will feel if Harry comes to. Uh, put his pennies worth and say, uh, come on, treat me better. Do you feel like the announcement of essentially two new reality shows, Harry's polo show and Meghan's gardening show, does that set back the relationship between Prince Harry and Prince William? Because Prince William doesn't want to have to worry about ending up some, you know, remember that scene where uh, Harry shows Meghan Markle his cell phone after the Oprah interview? Like, William doesn't want moments like that out there in the world ever again. Yeah, and I think in, in these cases, it's not actually their life story. This is actually focusing on polo. So these these documentaries shouldn't have any reference to the royal family. Now, I don't know what sort of cook Megan is. She may be a blindingly good cook. I've never had the privilege of her cooking for me. So if she is genuinely someone not just cashing in because, you know, how much washing up does she actually do? I'm probably not a lot. And does she peel the potatoes? Well, I, you know, I, I, I have a feeling that there may be somebody around, there may be a sous chef around in the corner. Um, but 
if Harry and Polo, I get what it's about, but it's going to have to be really interesting. Look, the Polo world is is a sort of glitzy, you know, and all sorts of things go on. The dashing Polo players and goodness knows what they're doing with will all run very rich people bankrolling these teams. So there's an awful lot of sort of soap opera. But how much will Harry want that to be come across, portraying the polo world as a sort of, um, well, what we would describe as a Jilly Cooper novel, which is, you know, bed hopping here, left, right and centre. And uh, so, you know, that, I mean, that's what it's all about. That's what, you know, the polo world might be perceived as. And you can certainly, you know, these dashing polo player comes on that they haven't fallen out of the ugly tree that's for sure some of these polo players so you know you you can look at it this way and say you know it, it might have some resonance you know the sort of we see documentaries of billionaire lifestyles but polo it's a niche sport it's a it um it's not a great spectator sport because you can't really see anything um if you can see the um you know, the, 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 the ball being hit, you know, it's it's blood and thunder, the horse is running around, it's a, he's got a but it's 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 niche. Uh people tend to go to be seen rather wouldn't have a clue. You know, if you said to most of the people, What's a chucker? they'd probably go, Well, let's see you chuck a ball at somebody. No. Um a, a chucker play, it's, yeah, it's, what? What's a chucker sounds like something I've accidentally typed on in, on uh, over text message when I was <laughs> confused by something. I yeah, I had no idea that polo could basically be interpreted as a giant swingers party until I started really reading some of the articles on the Daily Mail, and I was like, Whoa. well, yeah, well, that, well, I, yes, you know, that's it, it could easily be, you know, um, you know, I I'm I'm not gonna, that's the world it does generate, and it is, you know, I've been, I. I occasionally go to the odd polo match. I remember going as a very young lad, being taken out of the school. And my Sunday entertainment was being taken to the guards polo club uh, by my parents. Um, and then walking in at the half time. I have no idea what was going on. But the guards polo club is, a, you know, eminently sociable place to go to on a Sunday afternoon. But after people, if you're in the hospitality area, they're there for a nice glass of uh, champagne <laughs> and wearing some posh clothes, you know, expensive clothes, which they probably haven't paid for. All right, so I wanted to talk to you briefly about Polo because there's that video circulating of Meghan Markle where she seems to be asking uh, uh, someone to move away from Prince Harry. Um, she's being criticized for this. Um, even I made the comment that it felt like you were seeing some of her controlling nature on display you know, she's often said that she wears the pants in the family. And I was like, that visually says that right there. Uh, you had some great feedback about what typically takes place in that moment and how it translated on video. Can you talk to me about that? Was well, that a misinterpretation of Megan asking? I, 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 think, I think the optics, when it comes to Megan and Harry, you're either in the Megan and Harry camp that you like them and everything they do is golden. And then there is a very strong camp the other way who won't have anything to do with them so therefore that at times you get the feeling they're damned if they do and they damned if they don't now the way presentations work within the royal family and i'll go back to royal ascot again where a member of the royal family will make a presentation potentially to the winning connections the royal family first up will be briefed by somebody as to what to expect that the trophies are in front of you Right, X right, trainer will come up, the owner will come up, and the jockey will come up, and maybe the groom will come up, and there'll be a photograph. But they will know what's going on. So when you see sort of last minute things now, Megan coming up presenting the trophy, that's nothing unusual. Diana used to do it, Catherine's done it, so let's not overanalyze that. Why is she hogging the limelight? Perfectly normal, and she will get eyeballs because the photograph is going to be seen. So that's fine. They needed to make sure that they find no reason for there to be an excuse to criticize Megan for saying that woman should have gone straight to there rather than going the other side. And that sort of confused look of what are we doing here? They, that wasn't planned. So it's actually the, probably the PR people in the wings didn't say, right, that to that lady, you're going to stand in the middle because you're from the main charity and it's your moment. Harry be there. I'll be next to you get on with it so to not to ensure that we didn't have this sort of you know it looks like megan's trying to control the situation um i don't know whether she did or didn't
but that's what they need to make sure doesn't have again because there's always seems to be an excuse you know she was even criticized for wearing stiletto heels across the ground well and when and then comparing Kate, Kate, princess of wales doing a polo and wearing a sensible pair of high shoes i mean you know give me a break you know I mean, I remember I was at Ali McGraw, you might be, you're from Tinseltown, but a long time ago, I cover a bit of tennis. We're digressing a bit. I know it's airs and spares, but, you know, Ali McGraw was filming a rubbish film at Wimbledon back in the 70s. I was an extra in it, and she walked across centre court in stiletto heels. My goodness me. I mean, the groundsman in the 70s must have been having a hissy, absolute meltdown. But, I mean, if that is the kind of scrutiny that they're always under. And you would go back to our initial point about the Princess of Wales under the level of scrutiny that she is. That's the same thing that even you're working out, Megan's at a polo and she's wearing stiletto heels. Well, you can wear stiletto heels if you put that little plastic thing on the bottom of them. Your feet don't suddenly disappear into the turf. But anyway, what do well, I know? I mean, Rupert, look at you. You're Mr. Vogue. I mean, I, I mean, that's, that's a really look at your like your your stiletto um, polo hack. Well, no, I, I, the, I thought she looked beautiful uh, at polo, but I also thought she looked like somebody from Suits. I didn't think she looked like a member of the royal family, and that's okay because her ultimate objective is clearly Hollywood. It's no longer, uh, you know, the title is nice and the title is getting their, getting them further in their careers entertainment-wise, but clearly if you look at her outfit, if you look, you know, Catherine would never show belly. Catherine wouldn't wear those heels because Catherine's objective is not to court Netflix and Catherine's objective is not to court Hollywood. She has a, a different... Um, objective at the end of the day and that's fine that's just to that's totally okay absolutely and knowing there was a tv documentary crew in evidence uh, make sure that she's suitably attired for the occasion well that's the point we know that's the way it works you know if there is a documentary crew in town look they're going to want to make sure that uh, she looks good harry looked dashing in his sort of not only his riding outfit but you know sort of with his trendy pair of shades looking very sort of california-esque -esque, if that's the word um you know uh but you know fair play that's that and looking like you're going to a trendy polo environment so that is perfectly normal but you know obviously we know there is a subplot to this in that it was going to be filmed so given that it's hollywood she will make sure that she spent a little time with her makeup artist Amen. So we'll be really <laughs> brief about this uh, This next story. This is a, a regarding Prince Harry being carefully stage managed uh, for a public appearance with Better Up. Now, this was an event he did in San Francisco at the beginning of last week. People paid about $1,200 just for the online portion. Um, and they expect, I think some of them were disappointed to see that Prince Harry did an in-person segment, but not the online segment. And some experts are saying that perhaps Prince Harry is being wrangled, um, that they're not uh, giving people so much access to him, you know, it, it, probably to ensure that he doesn't say anything that m is misinterpreted, probably to protect not only the Prince Harry brand, but the Better Up brand. Um, do you, I mean, I don't, I, I honestly don't see how this is um, a, a story. I think that he probably, after leaving his father, after the cancer diagnosis, said immediately t telling ABC News, you know, uh, yeah, cancer can bring people together. I feel like it's probably best that somebody pulls him in and tries to structure him better. Well, he needs it and he wants it structured because one of his beefs is he want they Meghan and Harry want to control the narrative. You know, if they're at an event, you know, everything will have to go through their PR people. This is the whole point. And this is what I think, you know, is the modern PR world. You know, in Tinseltown, the leading actors, the leading actresses, they always want total control. You're going on to a chat show. You can only ask me questions about this. That Everything is controlled. And that's the same with Meghan and Harry. And that's what they feel they want. Now, when it comes to better up, I assume Harry has been played, paid a significant sum to be part of this organisation. Um, what he brings to it, I don't know, apart from his name. Um, yes, he meets lots of people. But... Um, 
is he going to give anything really insightful to the, the people who are joining into these online discussions? Well, that's something if he's been trained and he can contribute uh, rather than just lots of word salad, then maybe. But if he's in person, you know, if he's going to turn up, some people will pay big money just to say they're in the same room as Prince Harry. So for better up and their sort of business ethos, it probably hopefully does, from their perspective, justify their fee that they're paying him because they will be generating significant business off the back of him. But he has to, at the same time, work for his money, this Prince Harry, to justify whatever fee he's getting and that uh, they feel they're getting value for money. And that may mean he has to compromise and do things occasionally online with people so they feel that the people paying their $1,200 or whatever it is are getting value for money. What do you think Prince Harry could contribute to a conversation about the pressures of today's world and modern corporate life? <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't remember him getting up at uh, eight, six o'clock in the morning and commuting into work on a daily basis. But he's done it. He, look, he's come from a gilded family and everything's been done for him. And that's part of his problem. He wants still to be part of that, but actually in the big wide world, you actually have to knuckle down. And that's going to be the thing that he's going to have to find a way. And it's all very well glamorously going over to nice occasions, going to conferences where you've probably been briefed and you could meet and greet. Well, that's what he did in the royal family. You meet and greet and you do. So he's almost transposing what he did in the royal family to a commercial environment. Well, that's fine. But it does come at a cost because when you do things in a commercial environment, there are PR expectations of you and you've got to go with that. Because in the royal family, you might have a little bit more control over your diary because you're not, OK, being paid per se. Um, OK, you, you've got a, money from the, the, uh, gov you know, the state funding. But in the commercial world, you know, Kinsey, that you are expected to sing for your supper. And that might mean... PR world and you have to you have to graft and these people Meghan and Harry are being paid significant sums of money and it should and you hope that they have the good sense to realize that if someone is going to pay them significant sums of money you don't just turn up and move do half an hour and then say thank you very much now give me the check that mustn't be the approach because then that then that word will get around and they very few people will want them but at the moment they do seem to be able to generate some interest and some commercial value. But it will be two years down the line, Megan's development with her organisation, she might be turning over significant sums of money because it does seem, and you would know more than I, that if she wears a dress, it has the potential to sell out online. Well, good luck to her, then she will make big bucks. If she, whatever she produces, even if it is a superior frying pan, that you can get through her organization or whatever. If it's got the Markle brand, it might have a chance, or Sussex or whatever they're um, going to yeah, call gonna it. Yeah, I was going to say, it's going to say Duchess of Sussex. <laughs> yeah, it's going to say the Duchess of Sussex, but she doesn't want to be part of the royal family. But right, there's right. another story. <laughs> All right, well, do you think that um, Megan's going to have a superior frying pan? You've got to let us know in the comments below. Will you be watching? Prince Harry's polo show on Netflix. Let us know in the comments below. Make sure you subscribe to Talk TV on YouTube. Rupert, I always have so much fun talking to you. So thank you so much for spending your day with me. Um, I, you are so, you're such a, a swimming pool of knowledge and I adore you. <laughs> well, it's very kind of you to say, Kimsey. The one thing I don't like is I don't like swimming. So I hope I have better knowledge than a swimming pool of knowledge. There you go. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>